Very thankful to be here and to be offering the, for the two-day Indigenous History Forum. Very thankful for the funding that we received from Rio Tinto. My name is Diana Day, and I'm the lead matriarch for the Pacific Association of First Nations Women. And I'm very thankful to be and very honored to be uh, leading the Pacific Association. Um, we have a, a wonderful board of directors and uh, doing some great work in capacity building with our communities and really wanting to extend that into mainstream and to be providing some education on uh, Indigenous truth-telling and uh, some of the history that uh, is not told in our schools, not told in our in our public education system. And so many of our... Many of our uh, people, uh, our own people, but also mainstream are also unaware about our people. And so it's really important that we're able to to come together in this way to be able to share. I'm so thankful for it for Zoom as well, too, that we're able to attract a, a wider audience uh, from, around, from around Turtle Island. So welcome so to the uh, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Muskegon Fair Territory, which is located in the Vancouver area. I am from the Squamish Nation, and uh, I'm really grateful to the Pacific Association of First Nations Women to bring us together once again. I appreciate all the good work that you do, and I hope that you're all safe and sound during this heat wave, as well as I want to send a special prayer to all the residential school survivors, the day school, the 60s, Scoop and um, and the children that are in care today, and I really want to acknowledge um, the families of the loved ones that uh, were recently um, that recently came to light, and just really want to thank everyone for the support that's being offered by um, so many organizations such as this one. Thank you, D Diana Day and your team for being there and supporting all of us throughout this, this very uh, time of mourning and grieving. And, and so with that, I really wanna thank you for taking the time to listen, to learn and to hear from so many amazing people that are knowledge keepers of our history and uh, and where we come from and, and how important it is as Indigenous people to be able to tell our own story. So from our shared territory and uh, the land that we are um, gathering on today from, uh, from all of us, we really wanna thank you for, for taking the time to be here. And uh, again, I send my special thank yous to all that made this so possible, the funders, the sponsors, and the organizers. Diana, you have a great team that you work with, and I'm so grateful to be part of this. And uh, I wish everybody a great couple of days in this opportunity for learning. And my apologies, I don't have my drum with me today. Otherwise, I would share a song with you. But um, just know that I'm thinking of you and thinking of each and every one of you. And stay cool, stay calm. Um, drink lots of water, water is life, and uh, thank you again. Chenkwaman told me I hold up my hands to each and every one of you. Osiem, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Kat Nora. I'm so Salish and I'll be your uh, host for today. Very happy to be here and very happy to introduce George Kennedy. Um, George Kennedy has a PhD in research in inter-Indigenous inter diplomacy that covers well into pre-contact. We'll be speaking today on the contribution made to the Haudenosaunee to their European ship to this land, various treaties. We will also share the response of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe to the then newly formed IndyMac. So cheers for George Henry, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be doing, a, a, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is George Kennedy. I come from the uh, Oneida Nation Turtle Clan. Um, currently uh, working on my dissertation, so PhD, ABD, all but dissertation. Um, so I've been spending a number of years in uh, my undergraduate and my master's and uh, currently my PhD uh, specializing in Indigenous history. 
what I wanted to talk about is uh, the Haudenosaunee and uh, the, uh, I guess, uh, the Easter, the East Coast, or better known as, uh, I guess, today is uh, the Great Lakes Basin. Um, and uh, so eventually, uh, by the end, we're going to be talking about the Six Nations um, after the Tuscarora joined. But I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself. But what you see there is a wampum belt. And each of these diamonds uh, represent council fires, uh, lives of the nations. Um, and this, this specifically is uh, known as the Oneida Belt. Um, so uh, it was the uh, Oneidas that, uh, that uh, took in, well, uh, the, I guess the Tuscaroras uh, formally, but there were, there were many other nations uh, from the East Coast that uh, sought shelter under the Great Tree of Peace. Oh, next slide. So they, I wanted to share a couple of uh, renditions um, of artists, Haudenosaunee artists, uh, because uh, it's important that, uh, you know, to support our artists. And I think in these, uh, you know, dark and troubled times that we're in right now, we need to uh, look at our, at our artists and uh, support them. Because they're really a reflection of our society and our beliefs. So instead of going right into... Um, treaty belts and that I thought I'd be a good start to just lightly talk about, I guess, from the beginning, uh, uh, the creation story of the Haudenosaunee and there's a number of different versions. Um, but what, uh, what the general uh, uh, idea is that the uh, Sky Woman uh, was falling through and was uh, carried down on top of a turtle's back uh, by, by birds. Um, and there was a number of uh, animals that uh, sacrificed their lives trying to collect uh, collect earth from the bottom, the bottom of the water. And uh, eventually it turned out that the muskrat was the last one to be, well, he eventually, he, he, he kind of floated up at the end, um, but they opened up his little paw and it had dirt in there. So what they did is they did was they uh, spread that on that turtle's back and uh, Sky Woman danced on it in counterclockwise fashion and that spread spread out Turtle Island. So that's that's why uh, the Haudenosaunee uh, dance in that counterclockwise is to honor Sky Woman and creation. So um, just to uh, let everybody uh, just keep that in mind uh, next time uh, you know they see us doing things and I guess in a, in a, in a counter way from, from what they're used to seeing. So there's a next next slide. There's a couple other uh, renditions and this is uh, another um, another artist is in the Museum of Civilization. As you can see, it's a three-dimensional uh, rendition. Ladies. Yeah, there's another one by Arnold Jacobs. And that, that last one was by, uh, excuse me, Shelley Nero, um, another famous artist, and it's by Arnold Jacobs. Okay. And that first uh, wampum belt, they're actually made out of these uh, shells. So the Welk and the Quahog. So you can see the amount of time and uh, delicacy, or you know, uh, intricacy that was required to to uh, to make each shell. So when these when these belts were strung together, uh, they were con they're, they're considered alive, and uh, they're not really meant to be locked up in museums. Uh, they're to be spoken to, and uh, you know, uh, I guess repolished. They're spoken to, and. Uh, uh, We'll be talking about the Silver Covenant chain later. Those are the things that have been have not been uh, have not been uh, you know polished for quite some time. Okay, next slide, please. So um, the peacemaker, they say that uh, he came from around, I guess, uh, the north shore of Lake on what's known today as Lake Ontario, and uh, he was uh, he had uh, quite a following, uh, not only with the with with his peers, but also with the, with the animals, because he had such a, such a gentle uh, a spirit. So, um, so what he did was he, he, he was a messenger of the great peace. And uh, when he got old enough, he took off, of, well, he didn't take off, but he made a, a, a canoe um, out of uh, white stone and he traveled across to the to lands of the, the Mohawk. And uh, this is extremely cut down version um, uh, some of the the, uh, the 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 knowledge holders of the the Haudenosaunee uh, do not 
do these talk about uh, the peacemaker's journey uh, every year. Well, I'm not since COVID, it's been on a hiatus, but uh, there is some really good uh, momentum going um, every year, and, and uh, the peacemaker's uh, uh, journey has been shared from community to community. So, uh, next slide. So this talks about uh, his travels uh, over to the, um, they say that the, uh, and this, this was uh, made by uh, Orn, Orn Lyons, uh, faith keeper for the Onondaga Nation, I believe, Kirkland. So he traveled across Lake Ontario to uh, the lands of the, the Haudenosaunee, or the five nations that were known back then. And uh, the Mohawk, uh, did, I guess this is a, uh, to, to demonstrate uh, the strife when they said there was constant uh, bloodshed and uh, so much that the, the, the grass was stained with blood. So it was just uh, you know, uh, a constant feud, reparation against one another. So uh, the peacemaker came across and, and once again, I'm, I'm not doing great service to this, but I just want to give a general background to who the Haudenosaunee people are and our general philosophy of uh, of, um, of the great peace. So um, next slide, please. So he went to the, I guess this is another painting. I, I can't say who the, who the artist is for this, but um, it talks about uh, the land of the people of the Flint. So you can see the peacemaker uh, uh, symbol as being uh, the individual on the left and the white. Uh, once again, the white uh, wampum stands for uh, peace as well. So. You see the dark, the dark wampum. That's kind of for um, kind of dark and troubled times. So you'll see all that. All of most of the, the peace treaties, they're predominantly white. So this is where he's spreading. Uh, he's spreading the message that uh, he he sent uh, from, uh, from from the Creator to to send, uh, you know, uh, spread the words of peace, power, and righteousness. So these uh, those are English words. Uh, that are trying to define what those concepts are. Uh, however, um, it's really hard to um, to translate uh, these beautiful words. Um, uh, but I guess in the most simplest forms, that's uh, the most uh, one of the best ways uh, that I have to utilize so far today. So the Mohawks said that uh, they would they would lay down, or you know, they, well they had the test form. But like I said, we're kind of on time here. But he did a he did a test uh, to show that he was truly sent by uh, Sanguia Dizon, and uh, so they accepted the great peace. And he went and traveled westward to the to the Oneidas, um, and then you can switch the the screen again, please. Uh, through to the Oneidas, and there's a there's you know this, this story, and it didn't happen overnight. It took many years for this to happen. But uh, this, this uh, I believe this is again by Orrin Lyons. And this is when uh, the chiefs were walking up to, uh, to Dadaho, um, if I'm saying even that correctly. Uh, but, uh, but anyways, he was, a, he was a person of great power among the Onondagas. But when they came up and they were singing uh, the songs, um, they said that uh, his body uh, became uncrooked and... Uh, they began, uh, you can switch to the next one. I believe it'll be more, there we go. So, uh, and I totally skipped over Jakana say he, uh, Peacemaker was one of the first individuals that he met when he came over across from, uh, they say the, the territory of what they you know, what, what the English called them as Huron. Um, so you see, uh, you see them doing, uh, uh, singing the, the hi hi. Um, so this is what they, and if you ever, uh, yeah, it's an actually really beautiful song. I'm not going to do it here, but um, it's really extremely beautiful and very soothing, almost like a lullaby. So you see Jakana say uh, combing, combing the snakes out of his hair and his body was becoming uncrooked because he's becoming of a good mind. Um, what they said was, though, so uh, in order to uh, accept a great peace, he would be, uh, 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 he would have that title that didn't have a, that didn't have a, a clan mother. But he would have to be the, the Onondaga Nation would be the you know, the wampum keepers and the fire the fire keepers as well, and the national capital. I guess if you could look at it that way. Um, so these these uh, meetings still happen. You know, 
these days in modern times in Onondaga, New York, the capital, never a uh, nation, uh, you know, asked for, asked for that. So, um, so we can go on to the next screen. And so from this, as you can see, predominantly the back is, um, you know, probably dark. So that represents the dark and troubled times. But as you can see, uh, starting over here in the east, um, you know, with the, with the Mohawks, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cuga, and the Seneca. And also the, uh, there were, the Seneca were extremely powerful um, when a peacemaker came to them and, and, and the other delegates. And uh, so what they said was uh, you, would have a, you would have a responsibility as uh, keepers of the Western door these two titles, um, because there was, uh, you know, um, as you know, that the Mohawks are keepers of the Eastern door. And we'll get to that later, but when, when the Mohawks had left after uh, the American Revolution, the Oneidas were the Eastern door, and they were getting the brunt of uh, most of the colonists and uh, push uh, westward, especially for the uh, Erie Canal, building uh, westward and building America. Okay. So this is uh, the, the circle of... Uh, 50, they say Lodi and Esso, um, or in the, in the history books, they call them Sashams. Um, but this really, uh, this, this represents the, 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 the 50 titles, well, the 49 um, for clan mothers. Um, so you see here the 14 for the Onondaga, um, uh, the Cayuga, the Oneida, the Mohawk, and the Seneca. So that's kind of, this is kind of crooked, but if it was turned that way, that's kind of how they sit in the Longhouse and Council. Okay. And this is a contemporary uh, rendition of the Six Nations uh, Confederacy. And you can see, um, I was told by a friend of mine that uh, these Gustolas came into being after Sir William Johnson so that he could, uh, they could identify uh, the delegates that were coming to Council. So again, the Council fires these uh, Smoke holes emulate uh, council fires of the each of the nations. And, uh, the Mohawk with the three up are the Oneida, two up, one down, and so far and so on. And the, I believe the Tusk Roars are the ones with uh, without one. And these are just the three clans. This is by uh, Raymond Sky. I want to give uh, him credit. Uh, I just want to go through these real. I just wanted to show. I don't. I'm not going to spend any time on these. But the three clans of wolf, bear, and turtle. So I believe you can purchase these through Good Minds, but once again, that was made by uh, Raymond Sky, talented artist. So again, after the when they accepted the great uh, or the great peace, uh, what they did was they cast all of their their weapons um, against each other. Uh, I think that's extremely important. Say um, <clears throat> the weapons against each other uh, under underneath this uh, this white pine. And if you look at the white pine and the, the long needles, you can you can tell it's a white pine not only by you know the color, but also by um, by the way that um, the, the the five uh, needles come out. So those represent that five nations uh, that agreed to that peace. So when they erected that great peace, they said it would uh, go all the way up and grow forever up into and pierce the you know the, the you know, pierce the sky and continuous growing. And once again, that's, those are all wampum, that this is a, the original belt. Um, this isn't, but the, the original, I have a growing tree. So which all, with all of those uh, wampum beads, you could, those were made through hand tools, no steel. It's all, all with the elements. So you can tell by the, the amount of effort, you know, made, you know, contributed toward you know, solidifying these agreements. So this is a contemporary picture of the Gaswenta, I guess it's generally known as, uh, roughly 1613, uh, the two row. Uh, so this was uh, established uh, when the first Europeans made contact with the, with the Mohawk, is the best of my understanding. Um, so it, this isn't totally accurate. Uh, you see that is in, is two beads there should be continuous. But anyways, what I want to share with you on this is the basis of the three, the three white rows. So peace, friendship, and respect. And uh, so that was the basis of our understanding of each other because uh, the early, uh, the early Lodi and Esso uh, came to the realization after, after quite some time that the, the Lazlunis couldn't, the Lazlun couldn't be brought under the, the circle of 50 chiefs under their clan system. 
uh, well, not as a whole. So they developed this, uh, this, this understanding of their relationship based on peace, friendship, and respect. And uh, I'm going to go into further detail, the Haudenosaunee River of Life. I think just transitions, you can hit it again and it'll, go, it'll pop up. Keep going. Okay, responsibilities within creation, again. Respond responsibilities within family, clan, and nation. And responsibility of uh, land held in common. So this is something that we're, we're uh, you know, more and more uh, kind of straying away against is this concept of owning private ownership of uh, our, our, of our Earth Mother. I can see you, Edgy. Okay, um, yeah. unity, peace, and friendship. Relationship between two different societies. I, I would I would change the wording on this, but it's to respect each other. Respect each other's uh, language, uh, cultural values. On to the next one. And I already mentioned this is a spell. There's a spelling problem with that. On to the next one, please. Okay, so this is the traditional, this is kind of what it sort of looked like uh, during contact. So you can see all of these, these look at these names here. Uh, a lot of these nations actually had left their territories and sought shelter uh, under the Great Tree of Peace, you know, on their way to, you know, other places as well, um, you know, more westward up to Wisconsin and that. Okay, so yeah, yeah the yeah. Mohawk tonight are like kind of uh, the same thing as uh, shared before in the Wampum Belt. So this is a covenant chain made with the British crown approximately 17 or 1664. As you can see on, on this side is the uh, with the heart and the Les Loon. And uh, I just wanna, I've been told, shared with me that the, the term uh, Les Loon isn't a uh, derogatory word in, in uh, Onondaga Neha in the United language, it's, uh, it actually refers to our original relationship with one another. And they're makers of sharp, sharp things. So we traded uh, hatchets and, and knives and stuff like that with them. So that was our understanding of, of what they were and our purpose at, at the time. Makers of sharp things, Leslie's. Next one. So you can see that line. Oh, it could go back, sorry. There's a, even with the two or wampum, there, there was language, even though it wasn't articulated in, 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 in the belt, there's an oral history that, that speaks to uh, connecting the, the European vessel to, to a rock or, or a tree. So as, as this relationship got stronger, you know, and uh, got further into uh, to the Onondaga nation, they said that they would, uh, they would say that that rope would, would now be made of iron. And then over time, it turned into silver, which need to be refreshed and polished every year. So that's what I was kind of referring to earlier, how this covenant chain needs to be polished. Um, it used to be done uh, uh, annually, especially when the, uh, when the British crown needed uh, the original peoples of this land to uh, fight in their wars. We'll speak to you a little bit later. Okay, next one. And then going a little bit further from 1664 is this was uh, made in and around 1699. There were many attempts by both sides to um, create peace amongst the Haudenosaunee and uh, the Western nations, not necessarily just the Anishinaabe, but the Fox, the Dakota, others. Um, so they're there in, in the Soon after this was established, so this was this was pre uh, pre intervention with with the colonists, even though they like to put they like to take credit for for these things. So this was actually made between uh, the indigenous nations uh, themselves. So in 1700, 1701, and this is known as the dish with one spoon, which goes all the way back to the establishment of the Great Peace, um, because. When they established the Great Peace, they shared uh, a bowl in common, and uh, they ate beaver tail out of it. And uh, 
beaver tail is extremely uh, uh, nutritious, extremely rich. I've tried it. It's very strong, um, but it's extremely healthy for you. Um, and the beaver hunting lands actually covered the whole Great Lakes Basin. So it's not just the, the southern part or part of uh, southern and southwestern Ontario as a, a lot of the courts nowadays like to uh, try to argue for only hunting rights. So uh, going next one. Well, and there's a story, you don't have to go back, but there's a story as to why it's referred to as a spoon. Um, at the time of the Great Peace, they wanted to, uh, they did not include any sharp utensils. Uh, so hence the word spoon, uh, because they, were, they wanted to ensure that there'd be no further bloodshed amongst, uh, amongst, amongst the peoples. So going back to, I know I was talking about the, the longhouse and you've seen a picture of one. This is a reconstruction of one out of Campbellville, Ontario. It's actually built exactly on site of uh, a settlement that was discovered. And another uh, uh, feature that we find with uh, these contemporary villages is these palisades that try to make it look like castles and um, how there was a, you know, they were uh, uncivilized and uh, a constant warfare, warfare with one another. And this, is, this, uh, this community is one, um, example of that they they constructed palisades around it just for that feel um just for the tourists uh, because there was there was no palisades actually found around so they they referred to these people as the neutral or adirondan um uh just be based on that however uh, through my research uh, i'm sure there's a lot of other plausible uh, explanations uh, such as uh, perhaps weather or um uh, wildlife so when you have young infants uh, in your community, you may not want uh, certain uh, cougars that, as they are starting to show up nowadays back home in our communities and panthers. But anyways, that's just a little side piece on palisades and what you'll find nowadays in these reconstructed um, uh, villages around. This was around 1550, this village itself. And of course, back then, they didn't have a, uh, a door with a handle there. So that's something that's a new feature. Okay, then the next one. So this is what I would look inside. So it was, uh, you know, families, uh, four, they say four families shared a uh, single fire. Next one. They dried corn in the rafters. And uh, life sustainers, gin heck, corn, beans, and squash. So this is referring back to the... Um, 1701. So this was documented by the Europeans. And this one talks about where uh, the Western nations come to the five nations uh, in, in their capital of Onondaga, New York. Um, and once again, to he had a one kettle, one dish, and when one spoon, and so be as one mind, body, and spirit. So I added that, that last part there, but to be of one people. So this is a beaver. Uh, hunting lands according to the 1701 Nanfan Treaty. So this was this treaty was uh, was um, dealt in Albany, New York, at the same time as it, uh, there were Haudenosaunee delegates that went to Montreal to establish the 1701 uh, Great uh, Treaty of Great uh, Treaty of Peace in 1701. In Montreal, it also included about 34 uh, Western nations. So in going further, um, probably post-doc post uh, research will be to examine. There have been other uh, examinations of the 1701 uh, uh, treaty. However, uh, I don't think so many through, uh, through an Indigenous lens. Okay, next one. And you can go past that one. There's an interesting article there. Sorry about that. So this takes us to 1763. I know we're jumping, taking leaps and bounds here by generations, but it's really important to include this Royal Proclamation of 1763. This is where it uh, kind of said, this is, this is the last line that we're gonna go. Uh, this is Indian territory. Um, and of course, as we know, that, didn't, uh, that wasn't the last one. 
So it talks about the different uh, the different um, European powers that were uh, establishing themselves in uh, in this, this territory. Okay, next one. Excuse me. So it stated the crown had exclusive right to purchase Aboriginal land and forbade private purchases and encroachment by settlers on Indian land, thus articulating the concept that, that the crown could protect Indian land from encroachment by standing between the First Nations and other parties. <clears throat> and entrenched in the pr principle that purchases by the crown had to be made at a public meeting, stressing the importance of obtaining consent in an open and transparent manner. And that is, um, I can say um, from my research from the removal of Oneidas from the homelands, their homelands in what is now known as New York State. Uh, most of their, pretty much most of their, uh, their land was uh, dealt with illegally uh, from 1800 to, I think it was 1830. Um, so yeah, it is, but uh, that's another story. So even though, you know, we have these things uh, in place, um, they're, they're, they're not held up. So I wanted to talk briefly about uh, this friendship belt uh, made between uh, the Haudenosaunee and uh, Anishinaabe. And uh, so again, you have those three, three lines of white wampum. <clears throat> and those, again, those three concepts of peace, friendship, and respect. And you can see the difference between the, the two row and that uh, they recognize the other, uh, the other uh, the original people of this land. So it's having their own, their own nation on each side there, representing their own people. So this came about a time, <clears throat> I believe, when, uh, and this is my own belief, is that this, this belt came about, and it could even be before then, but around the time of uh, the, seventh, the French Indian War, when, when, the, when, the, when there was much encroachment coming um, within, as you could see, they made that promise of 1763, but they, they were utilizing, the Crown was utilizing the Haudenosaunee to outreach to the Western nations to get them to, to side, to side with, the, with, the, with the British Crown. And hence the, the Treaty of 1764, Treaty of Niagara. And as you can see, when once the, uh, uh, the Crown uh, figured how important wampum were, were to the uh, original people of this land, they made factories of it for them. And they made these huge elaborate belts. Um, that, as you can see, utilize uh, different concepts, utilizing time um, into, their, into their agreements. Uh, next one. So this is the, uh, the Western nations that uh, that were a part of it. So right, right now we're on the Treaty of uh, Fort Niagara. And uh, some of the names uh, were current at the time of the 1760s, but uh, not used so much today. Uh, you can see the, the S-A-K-I-S. Today they're better known as uh, socks, uh, autogamies as foxes, uh, and so on and so on. Um, the uh, I don't know how to pronounce some of these. The the Krishna are are known as Krees. Um, so the Puans as uh, Winnebago. So so on and so on. So um, Akwesasne uh, had been formed as a separate community in 1750, when 30 families moved from their from from Ganawage in um, in uh, Sir William uh, Johnson's records, anyways. Uh, Akwesasne uh, is sometimes referred to as uh, of the Kaunawage uh, castles. And the people included uh, uh, as Kaunawage uh, uh, brothers and Western nations. Uh, so there's all these different languages uh, that, are, that, are, that need to be explored and uh, consulted with, um, with other uh, First Nation scholars from their respective uh, nations. And I apologize for uh, mispronouncing. Um, <clears throat> so when, when Sir William Johnson gave us, I'll give a quote from that, uh, that I now therefore present uh, you the great belt, 
by which I bind all your Western nations together with the English. And I desire you will take hold of the same and never let it slip. To which I desire that after you have shown this belt to all nations, you will fix one end of it with the, with the Chippewas of St. Mary's, whilst the other and remains at my house. Um, and moreover, I desire that you will never listen to any news which comes from any other quarter. If you, if you do, it may shake the belt. I exhort you uh, then to preserve my words into your hearts, to look upon this belt as a chain which binds you and the English. They will never slip out of your hands. Um, at the time he gave them the covenant chain and wampum belt, uh, Johnston promised the Western nations uh, a proof of his majesty's uh, bounty and uh, esteem uh, for good, honest Indians, quote and unquote. Okay, so uh, the George Washington belt um, came actually uh, around the same time as the uh, Jay Treaty, and I'm going to cover that next, but very briefly, I'm going to, uh, at the same time, George Washington presented uh, this belt to the Six Nations known as uh, Canadagua Treaty Belt. This is actually still uh, celebrated annually um, in New York. Uh, it's, it's quite large, six feet long. Uh, 13 figures, uh, and the two figures in the middle there represent the, the Senecas um, and uh, for the Western door and the Mohawks for the Eastern door. And the 13 figures represent the 13 colonies. So uh, when George, uh, George Washington uh, um, made, this, made this belt as a treaty, uh, they, they tried to end the quarrels between, uh, between them because, because the, uh, when when, uh, when the British gave up, the, the Confederacy was actually still fighting. Um, so a big piece of this uh, continuously is about uh, what seems to happen is uh, the, the exchange of presents. Um, so when you talk more about, um, you know, these presents, uh, that, uh, that quite, a, quite, quite a different understanding between the, the original peoples and, and what the uh, Europeans were, were actually meaning by those presents. Um, so on to the next one. And this is the Jay Treaty, John Jay Treaty of 1794. Um, so the representatives of the United States and Great Britain signed the Jay's Treaty, which uh, sought to settle outstanding issues between the two uh, countries. Uh, that were left unresolved since uh, America's independence. The treaty provided unpopular uh, with, the, with the American public, uh, but did accomplish the goal of maintaining uh, peace between the two nations and preserving uh, US neutrality. Uh, it is agreed that, all shall, that it shall at all times be free to his majesty's subjects and to the citizens of the United States, and also to the Indians dwelling on either side of the, of the agreed uh, boundary line freely to pass and repass the by land or inland navigation into the respective territories and countries of the two parties on the continent of America. Um, and to navigate all the lakes, rivers and waters thereof and freely to carry on trade and commerce with each other. So this is uh, one of the, uh, the J treaties that uh, I remember as a young uh, lad Becoming to, of an uh, understanding of this, the, the special right, well, the rights of uh, the original peoples of this land, uh, in exchange for uh, uh, sharing, sharing, um, sharing some of this land with the with the European uh, newcomers, with the visitors. Um, so there it is. There, the Jay Treaty. Uh, there's still, I think, border crossings that exercise this treaty. Um, although throughout the years, with homeland security and everything else, things have become a little bit more uh, difficult, I believe. Okay, on to the next one. So I already reread re that one. So on to the next one, please. War of 1812. By 1807, the yearly presence uh, of gunpowder, uh, shot, rum, uh, fine blue cloth and hats, uh, knives and ribbon were, were reduced. And this is according to uh, one of the, uh, the Norton papers. John Norton was one of the uh, recruiters of uh, the Haudenosaunee to fight. 
And uh, although the presents uh, are, are costly to the British crown, uh, it's costly for the Ojibwe to go attend the ceremony, not only to collect the diplomatic presents, but to renew their alliance. Uh, Chief Yellowhead and John Assens requested at their renewal to take at an earlier date because it disrupted their traditional way of lifestyle, uh, collecting wild rice. Um, so they had to travel all of, out of their home territories to come to, um, to ratify or to polish this chain. Um, so it was more of an inconvenience than, than, than they didn't need uh, these presents to continue on uh, with, their, with, their, with their lifestyle. So uh, William Claus, the Deputy uh, Super, uh, General, uh, Superintendent General of Indian Affairs replied, uh, would give directions that your annual presents shall be in future sent to you in a good season. Uh, of course, uh, that, that really didn't happen. And of course, the, um, only the converted um, Indians could actually have their presence uh, delivered more quickly than those that were considered pagan. So a general order was made on August 7th, 1813, stating that presence were to be given by officers or chiefs of renown, of renown who witnessed their gallant conduct before the enemy Instead of providing uh, presents, they were to provide them tokens or certificates of fidelity and bravery, according to John Norton. Okay, so the next slide. This is just a quick, this is what uh, John Norton looked like. Um, he went to Quebec um, and influenced the military secretary to, to uh, you should not to be interfered with in his dealing with the tribes and also uh, commanded that ample proportion of presents be uh, put up separately for the five nations in uh, 1814. Uh, eventually he ended up commanding about 400 warriors from uh, the six nations. Um, and there, there's some really good, um, some really good documentation of some of the battles. Uh, there was one, uh, uh, one battle that happened, I believe in Niagara region. And there was, there was only about half of them in, and it was nighttime, so they had torches. <laughs> so each of them lit a torch. So they held them up on the on the bluff, and it looked like there was twice the amount. And uh, the, the the Americans just turned around and uh, hightailed it out of there because they thought they were they were out, outnumbered. So John Norton and uh, his crew were you know pretty uh, successful in defending uh, the crown. Um, unfortunately, after after the service, he was uh, his his uh, support from the crown was no longer needed, and pretty much uh, died uh, a poor a poor person. And his mother actually was a translator for for a lot of the Eastern nations uh, generation before him. So he has a he his ability. Um, he was actually Cherokee, but he, he spoke a number of indigenous, er, er, a number of languages so that he could communicate for, for, the, uh, for the British crown and a number of different, uh, different arenas and territories. So after the War of 1812, uh, the Indiana Territory Governor Harrison seemed to have uh, driven Tecumseh into supporting the British, uh, not because of the issue of presence, but the issue that certain civil chiefs were, were selling lands to him. Uh, Tecumseh often referred to the Dish of One Spoon and uh, his attempts to unite the, the, the nations, the Western nations. Um, at a council on Drummond Island, uh, just west of Manitoulin Island on uh, July 7th, 1818, uh, Okarda, I believe, a speaker for the uh, Odawa, Anishinaabe, and uh, Winnebago uh, stated to Lieutenant Colonel McKay, uh, our ancestors one day on looking towards the rising sun saw people of a different color to themselves and not long after, after they, the French, stretched out their hands to us, uh, supplied them with goods. Uh, we were delighted at the appearance of these strangers. They treated us well and appeared to become our, our relations. Uh, we, we consented and soon after they kindled a fire at old uh, Mackinac, um, they called us their children. They told us we should never be in want or miserable with them that they would always give us uh, good supplies and furnish, furnish, us, with, furnish us with traders. Uh, they did so, my father. They never told us a lie. Neither did they deceive us. Father, while we were living in this happy state, <coughs> you, were, you were at play 
uh, with our with our father. He did, and of course, this is translated by another person. So uh, you have to understand the context. And uh, excuse me for for me uh, uh, regurgitating uh, what was been documented in in, in these um, probably not so uh, translated uh, words. So he desired us to join him uh, in a system in keeping you out of our country, our our ancestors tried, but notwithstanding our assistance, you you beat. Uh, you drove the French off our lands and took us under your arm and made, made peace. Uh, on making peace, you promised to treat us with the same attention the French had done, that we should receive a bounty annually of fine, fine things that would make us comfortable and happy. You also told us uh, your beasts would never be, never be dry and that we would have, have plenty of, of, of milk, meaning rum, uh, but then it goes on and on to talk about how um, they quietly, uh, how uh, after time you had got quietly seated on our lands, uh, uh, a neighboring nation of ours acted like fools, um, and they liked, uh, and there was there was bloodshed, bloodshed shed. So um, they were talking about they were talking about how um, how they needed to live up to that um, that original agreement. And how they forgot about that. Um, so they reminded them that your words were true. All that you had promised come to pass. On giving this belt to peace, you said, if she should require my assistance, send this belt and my hand will be immediately stretched forth to assist you. So at this point in time, they were, they were, in, they, were uh, they, they felt abandoned, especially after the War of 1812. Uh, they forgot all about uh, their allies. And that's when the reserve system came into play. And that's when all of the, this uh, legislation um, against the original peoples um, of this land came into being. So I have about 15 more minutes. Um, so these are some of the, the Six Nations uh, war veterans uh, of 1812 taken in 1877. Um, So I'll, I'll do a really quick, uh, this was by uh, an Onondaga on, on speaker. He says, brother, uh, you have completed your uh, usual annual visit and delivered us goods, uh, which our great father, the King of England, sends for ourselves and women and children for which we return him thanks. And also you have informed us of the change that in the future is a plan of giving us his majesty's presence uh, we would be ungrateful if we did not acknowledge um, his compassion. Um, uh, but he, he, but what they wanted to say that uh, is that they are not all drunkards, and to have, um, and so what they were talking about is their grievances uh, at the time, and this was, uh, you know, to the to right after, yeah. and this this was quite frequent. So every time there was a polishing of the chain. Um, which is what's, what's happening right here, that they re remind them of, of their grievances. Um, so they, they, he went on to say, you know, the friendship and alliance, which has so long subsisted between King and our, uh, our ancestry and ourselves, uh, this friendship, we hope, will still continue as long as the waters run and that he will not suffer the chain of friendship to gather rust. It appears uh, if it was beginning at the, at the beginning, so... Uh, it is so. It is so near the. It is so near the. Um, near the time. Next slide. So these are. I'm just going to share really quickly a little bit of the presents that were. Um, that, so after. So since 1816, the amount of uh, these presents had decreased. Uh, 100, uh, 117 uh, thousand uh, five hundred sterling to 19,000 19, in 1936. Uh, there's no doubt uh, that by improving the arrangements for their distribution, that um, you know, that amount may still uh, materially diminished. So that was, um, they were looking into um, releasing their commitments to the original people of this land um, after they had, after they solidified their spot in North America. Uh, they, they decided to um, to decline um, uh, 
carrying out their, their, their promises. And, and there's actually recent scholarly work by uh, non-Indigenous scholars who talk about the concept of those treaty making uh, and that it didn't involve um, the selling of land. Um, and there's the one article that really surprised me because for the most of Western uh, society, uh, that, that is a concept that uh, just isn't um, compatible. So not only was, uh, you know, these things of silver, but uh, the clothing, um, uh, flour, everything else, um, and what they really reduced was a uh, gunshot and weapons and, and the rum because that was that was definitely a uh, field to the warriors at the time when they, they needed their service. They, they loaded them up with weapons and, and gunshot and cloth and, and uh, rum to the young men so they couldn't go and fight their wars for them. So, um, so these are some of the silver brooches. Um, you can see silver was a big, a big thing back then. So there's, there's, there's more quotes uh, that I can share, but the point, the point really is, is that they were greatly uh, reducing uh, their acknowledgement of their, their allyship and partnership. So in 1828, there were 46 pairs of armbands provided as presents on November, uh, 29th, 1929, the Lords of the Treasury had approved the reductions in the Indian Department as recommended. The establishment in 1829 had the budget of five, roughly 5,000 um, pounds. And in 1830, it was even greatly, uh, almost half that to 3,000 pounds. So um, these things are well documented. Um, I don't know if you want to spend time in the archives looking for it, but it is there in secondary resources as well. So um, again, the reduction of present, crown presents. These are uh, actually Oneida ladies from Wisconsin. So you can see how they utilized that, the, the cloth and the ribbon and uh, kind of made it their own. Um, much with the other trade goods, such as copper kettles and that, a lot of the original peoples actually cut that into jewelry and the other purpose, not, not necessarily for, for cooking vessels. So this is uh, really um, in the 1820s and 30s when they really uh, reduced the Indian department's uh, budget. And that's when all of the, um, all of the uh, stolen monies from Samuel Jarvis and, uh, and uh, Joseph Grant Clench uh, of the 1830s uh, occurred. And uh, another individual is uh, Sir Francis Bond Head. He was uh, the Lieutenant Govern Governor of uh, Upper Canada. And he was, he was actually um, mistakenly recruited. They brought, they, they, mis, they mistook this uh, gentleman who had the same head as another, uh, another administrative uh, person. They, they found uh, Sir Francis Bonhead from South America though. And as you, um, from, my, from my research, South Americans had gotten even a worse, uh, Kind of a worse uh, situation than in, in, I guess, North, in Upper Canada. So when he came into power, he he um, he proposed to dispose of at least one third of the Indian presence, um, and and uh, but uh, he 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 only wanted to respectfully recommend that we should continue to deliver to those few Indians who continue to inhabit Upper Canada. So he just wanted to get rid of all of it. I've already stated that the expense will shortly be uh, defrayed altogether by the sale of the Indian lands. They have uh, this year liberally surrendered to us, to me rather, and even if, uh, and even that were not to be the case, I do not think that enjoying, as we do, possession of this noble province, it is our, uh, it's our bounden duty to consider as heirlooms, the wreck of that simple-minded, ill-fated race, which I have always started, it stated, is daily and yearly fading before the progress of civilization. End quote. So I just wanted to um, 
I guess I, you can skip the next couple of pages up to, I guess there's a, a, a document, a primary document is black and white handwritten. So I just wanted to share with this. Uh, it, it's probably hard to see, but this was this was uh, written by a uh, chief of the Anderson Community or Nation. I think I believe that's the community that is known today as uh, Caldwell, who was just recently reestablished. So in here, the the Oneida the Oneidas uh, were seeking lands and in, in, in beaver hunting lands. And this particular year in 1845, from my research, they've always been in search for, for more lands because they because of being dispossessed in, in, in New York uh, illegally, they've always been in, in the mind frame of uh, the mindset of uh, reclaiming, reclaiming territory for the, for the coming faces and future generations. So you can see this one dated in 1845 as a response to... Uh, to the, I guess, the Onondaga Lo Dianeso, their request to, for the Anderson to, uh, to share, to uh, share some of their land. Uh, however, if you, if you can zoom in and they're like, you don't need to for me, I do, I know what it says, but it says that they don't, they don't have the, uh, the power to, to enter treaty because they had already uh, sold all their lands to the government or something along those lines. Um, so, this is their response that they 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 weren't of the power. So, with this, it's a it's a demonstration that the you know the on, on, the, the Oneida uh, leadership you know were always of the mind frame of being a sovereign nation, coming over here and purchasing uh, uh, money out of their out of their out of their own lands, or money out of their um, monies out of their, their own pockets that they brought with them. And to the next one. So I just wanted to, I know I only have a few more minutes, but um, uh, every time um, a piece of uh, colonial legislation came across, there was always a response uh, from, uh, from Oneida, Lo Dianeso. And uh, that was, um, they wanted a, a clarification on, on the lands that they had purchased. Because that had been uh, there had been a constant struggle for for the United Nation to get to get copies of, of the lands that they purchased from um, for almost half a right, over half a half a century. So um, with this, you can see uh, the, res the response uh, from the United Nation is uh, so. This is from the Indian agent. So it, the United had a very different uh, relationship with their Indian Asian as others. Um, the, the Indian agent was allowed to sit in council. Uh, he had no authority. He was to be a messenger of, of the, of the Lodianeso to, to the crown. So he was, he was, uh, he was no, of no authority. He was basically a messenger. So they sent their Indian agent time and time again, and Indian agent after Indian agent to request the titles of the land that they purchased with their own monies. Okay, next one. So this one refers to the uh, the Act for the Gradual Enfran Enfranchisement of Indians. So this was when uh, the Indian Affairs would determine who is Indian. So at this time in, in 1870, this was when the uh, all of the, uh, the the I guess uh, the leaders of the, the Western nations and uh, the leaders of the, the Lodi and Esso, Haudenosaunee, Lodi and Esso, they um, they gathered um, in new credit at this time and and uh so there it was it was kind of ironic because the the Haudenosaunee they have this ancient uh diplomacy of going through all these ancient agreements every time they meet another nation so they're going through all these the, you know the just one spoon the friendship belt and all this is recorded you know even as far back as 1840 was some of the other things when uh the John Riley and Nishinaabe uh or uh, leader uh, spokesperson uh, did a con uh, condolence ceremony on Oneidas when they when it came to the Thames. So it's documented in you know in, in paper in, in leisure. So so all of these uh, 
all these leaders from Upper Canada, they came, they, they chastised the, you know, the parliament for, for, for putting this uh, gradual enfranchisement back. And this is a direct quote, proper consultation with the Indian people should be had when any act of par parliament is proposed, which may affect them. So we can, we can jump forward to 2021, and this is still the same kind of language. I'm not sure if the AFN is, you know, or the leaders uh, have seen this primary document of, uh, and it just so happened that a news reporter from the Spectator happened to be at this meeting. So this whole, uh, this whole thing could have been just in our whole history. However, in, in spending many years in the archives, um, I've been able to uncover quite a bit of information. Okay, next one. And this one is after the uh, Indian Advancement Act of 1884. Uh, this is much, this kind of mirrors uh, the Dawes Act in, in the United States. But it's really, um, it's really to break up pieces of the reserve and to have uh, councillors represent certain uh, geographic uh, areas of, uh, of a reserve. Um, so I'm running out of time, but once again, um, they sent, um, you know, the message um, that, uh, that there, there, there's issues going on here about the, the title of our lands. And, uh, it, that, um, and uh, there's one slide that I just wanna talk about that's not on here, but it, as far as, uh, my research to 1915, uh, there's, you know, the time when Duncan Cam Campbell Scott was really being intrusive, especially in terms of education. Uh, there have a, uh, a letter written by the, by the Oneida Lodianesso that uh, they're saying that they are not under the Indian Act. They follow, they follow the great law. So that's as far as 1915, as far as I've researched. So... The Oneidas have always continuously said that they're a sovereign, sovereign nation, you know. And uh, one of the arguments uh, is the fact that uh, they 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 solely hold title to the, to their lands, Donato. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. That was really important information, and I think we all learned a lot. I have one question. What brought you into doing your research, and has it helped you learn more about your own people? What got me into um, Indigenous research is uh, kind of as a mature student, um, as a as a youngster, I wasn't always encouraged um, <clears throat> to, uh, well, I guess, from, from other peers to, to be successful in education. Or once I, I had responsibilities, a young person in my life, that's when I went 150% um, towards education. And I found history as being the most, uh, my first paper I did was on uh, the Lakotas, actually, and then uh, the Blackfoot Confederacy. And it wasn't until later in, into my master's that I did uh, a look into Haudenosaunee uh, history. And that was because of uh, some of the articles, you know, the continuation of that Eurocentric telling of, uh, of uh, indigenous history is being barbaric and uncivilized. And one of my main focuses is, uh, is talking about the great peace and the inter-indigenous uh, inter diplomacy that had happened throughout North America from the Yukon all the way down to the tip of uh, South America. And you, new research is, is fueling this, um, not only, uh, you know, through archaeological sites, uh, but also through navigation. Uh, recently, there's articles being written that the, the, the Maoris made contact with the South Americans and made it to South America a thousand years before the Russians. So all of these, uh, there's new, a new consciousness coming about, you know, with this technology, but with technology and education and uh, uh, comes responsibility. So that's that with, with my education comes response. I feel a responsibility uh, to, to, to look at things, not only in the way that's been told over and over again, but include the voices of the, the, the knowledge keepers. Yeah, that's so awesome. You know, we need more, more of our people and more of our people are getting educated, going back to school as it's just been our role model. So, yeah, thank you for that. I'm going to uh, share with you questions online. 
so much. Um, thank you so much, George. Uh, one of the, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So one of the questions is, um, as we have a lot of young academics right now doing more research and following uh, your footsteps, what's an important piece of research that you think they should look into or they could help you with um, to continue this, um, you know, to continue uh, sharing the knowledge? Uh, one of the extreme, one of the most important um, aspects of research is to really um, flesh it out um, because you can't go on one source. Uh, I've because of my my discipline, I have to, I guess, investigate every 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 story that's that's available, um, and present it in its context of where it comes from, who's the author. Um, so that's really important. A lot of the primary uh, documents that were written by Peter Jones and some of these um, early Anishinaabe scholars, uh, they had the influence of, of the church. In, in the, well, I'm not saying that's a negative thing, but one must understand the context of that individual and where they're writing and what their mindset is and the time that they're in, that they're writing these things. So uh, there, I've done, uh, you know, um, Uh, a lit review of uh, indigenous uh, uh, indigenous uh, literature, uh, and that's one of my um, critiques: is uh, to really know where the source comes from as a historian. It's it's one thing to pull out an uh, interesting piece of information that may look really good to you, but uh, what are the facts behind that, and where does that source come from, and what are the other elements that uh, may have influenced that individual to 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 uh, to make that. Like that to actually be documented. So just uh, check your sources, cite your sources, and make a full range of sources. I actually my research is multidisciplinary, so I utilize uh, anthropology. I utilize um, uh, basically findings um, from another uh, a number of disciplines, in, in order to paint that full picture and for for the reader to consider, and not just to jump at the first thing that looks good that uh, may suit their may suit their what they're trying to say because um, historic uh, historic research is a discipline of, um, you know, of uh, not choosing side that's the new new school <laughs> but in my experience it's always been regurgitated over and over again thank you so much for having me it was a great pleasure and uh, keep doing all of uh, all of your great work. It was an honor. <laughs>